Our first speaker this morning is Lori Elliott uh, from Big Sky Herbs. And she is uh, self-taught and has a, her Big Sky Herbs is down near uh, Council Grove uh, State Park, if you've ever been there. And uh, she has a display here of her products. And she's going to be talking about the beneficial properties of culinary herbs. So, this is Lori. Hi, guys. Thank you. I appreciate you guys coming here. I have been growing herbs since about 1991 in the inland northwest. So, I'm a little obsessed with gardening. Um, <laughs> I, I just finished my 50-year career. A couple of months ago so you might see me around about town looking more like a farmer because that's what I'm gonna be wanting to do and today what I am wanting to share with you is to help you to love eating your medicine now there are a lot of foods besides herbs that are very beneficial but I'm going to center on some herbs that we can grow here that are local to us. Um, I'm only doing culinary herbs that are probably something that you would garden. Um, I have about 100 traditionally medicinal herbs and of those probably about 25 of them are native plants um, and others I've collected seeds from certified Northwest you know places like the seed swap. <laughs> Different places like that. Um, because I really believe in the idea of things around us and that it's going to benefit our body to eat local. So I wanted to share a little bit. One of the first things I want to talk about is how re research has proven that we actually are what we eat. So it's really important for us to put the right things in our bodies. Um, the gut is the main location of the human microbiome. You might have heard of that a little bit. Basically, the gut is all of our digestive system. It has all sorts of different bacteria, fungus, all sorts of things that need to be in synergy for our bodies to be in balance. And here's the biggie that I've been studying a little bit about lately that I love, not having inflammation. They're realizing that so many chronic illnesses, um, are due to inflammation in our body. And most of the time that inflammation starts out in our gut and spreads itself around. So having things, you know, in balance really makes a difference. One of the reasons, one of the things that you want to do to have your gut in balance is you want to have a variety of different foods. You know, a lot of the studies about the five main you know, America's five main food groups. Most of us Americans choose about two things out of each group. So it doesn't really give us a lot of variation in our diet. Therefore, when things come up, our gut is not in balance. And that's how inflammation starts. Um, and it continues as we keep feeding all those, you know, bacteria the wrong things so it can't stay in balance. Um, what I was going to share with you is that the microbiome really has to do with human physiology, both in health and disease, contributing to the enhancement or impairment of metabolic and immune functions. Okay, mouthful. The website's even more of a mouthful. It is. <laughs> the, the National Center of Biotechnology Technology Information dot <laughs> National Library of Medicine dot <laughs> National Institute of Health. But what I, the reason I bring this up is that even though I read, a, I started this back in 91 when I had a nice vegetable garden and I wanted, well, in Portland, Oregon. We moved back to Spokane, and 
I knew that the growing season was going to be quite a bit shorter and I wanted to make sure I could stay organic and do the very best by plants. So I got a little booklet on companion planting. A lot of different herbs next to plants help enhance their growth, do all sorts of things to make them naturally more healthy. And that led me to coming to the library back a long time ago and getting different books on herbs. And since then I've been purchasing books, not as much lately because I'd say in the last five or more years, most of my information comes online. And that's how it goes with, since I'm also selling these both culinary herbs and wellness tea herbs, I want to make sure I have the latest information. You know, I found out a while ago, you know, that I couldn't be selling belladonna because if I got any of the berries in there, that's real poisonous. You know, there's a lot of things that they've learned are carcinogen. So I got to keep up with that. But the other part is just how many more benefits they're finding out from both foods and herbs. The reason that I think that herbs are so important and what, what I'm excited about at this time is the fact that when you, practically speaking, when you're using herbs, you find a way to vary. You can put herbs with fruit, with vegetables, protein foods, grains and dairy products. There are your five food groups. And you can switch them up. You can learn to train your palate to enjoy different foods. You might even put certain herbs with certain foods just because they taste good and you need to eat more of them. Or you may put certain herbs with food to enhance their, you know, their quality of, your quality of life. I have, um, I have, I didn't, I'm sorry that you guys didn't get the printout. They didn't get my email in time. But I have in this little booklet, because I teach little classes like this, a booklet that has 16 different uh, culinary herbs and what their medicinal event effects are, which I don't know, I may be able to post somewhere so that you can download it, because I'm sorry that I don't have to give it out to you today. I've also, over the years, I accidentally started a learning blog because <laughs> I'm not very good, so I <laughs> just ended up doing another website. And so a lot of these in here, like the herbs that um, my biggest seller, shall we say, are basil, celery, or I actually grow lovage, cilantro, dill, fennel, garlic, sweet marjoram, lemon balm, called that a culinary herb because it works that way too. Oregano, parsley, black and hot peppers, rosemary, sage, savory, tarragon, and thyme. So those are some, you know, some of you don't use all of those, but maybe you'll learn to use more of them as you learn more about them. So in my learning blog, I have at least five or six of those where I've done a little learning blog on it. Mine are not long and exhaustive because my idea is to be able to have you incorporate herbs into your everyday lifestyle. Figure out what herbs you can stick with what, you know? And all these blogs have a little recipe on how to use the herbs fresh. Uh, Big Sky Learning Blog, Big Sky Herbs Learning Blog, or Spread the Herb, sometimes it's <laughs> put on there. So, and that would have been at the bottom of that printout. So afterward, if you'd like, you can come over to my booth over there, and if I give you a little, what you call my business card, which is more of a little pamphlet, it's got all the websites on there, so you can look up some different things. But I, I really wanted to just get you excited about the idea of using more herbs and growing more herbs. I think it's, um, I'm just going to show you something else here, see if I can do it right. Yes. <laughs> so, this is my soup night. <laughs> and I found a really easy way to incorporate herbs into your everyday foods, especially in the winter. Soups are so awesome. I've, I think this might just be vegetable beef soup Campbell's. Might not be anything really special. Now I tend to, you know, make my own. 
but I just would add things like, I almost always add some kale. I always have frozen kale on hand. I'll add some kale to it. And then, in this case, beef and game herbs that I sell. And it's just nice because it gives it a more gourmet flavor, something new and different to taste. And then the red tea in there is amaranth and rosehip tea. Um, I also even, a lot of times, I'll put a little bit of vinegar in the soup too, just to bring out more flavors. Which reminds me of how you might want to incorporate some different herbs into your meals, snacks, and foods. So the secret of cooking with herbs is not that, that big of a secret. One of the easy things you can do to begin with is to take either a, a fresh leaf from an herb um, or a pinch of you know, a er dried herb and just touch it to your tongue. Close your mouth and, and just sort of work it around a little bit. Get used to the flavor. Some things are better fresh, some things are better dried. I love the idea that I can, you know, harvest all these fresh herbs in the summer and then almost all of them I can dry and I've got them in the winter too, which is awesome. They're like a year-round thing that doesn't require <clears throat> canning or some of the other more <laughs> arduous things to do. But if you do that, you get an idea of, you know, what they taste like, different ones. You can do this with um, traditionally medicinal herbs as well. Um, then the other thing would be, next you might want to try them with your favorite pasta or grain. So you cook a little bit of grain. When we did our um, class, we had two people per station, so we only made a cup of pasta. We did, you know, gluten-free pasta. And so, you know, just takes, you know, three-fourths or half of a cup of the pasta, a cup of water, and boil it for a few minutes till it gets to el dente. <laughs> you can do the same thing with different herbs too, or different um, grains also. So you can do that, and then while they're draining in the sink, put equal amounts of either butter or oil and herbs in the bottom of your pan, have it on about medium low, and just stir them around for about two minutes so that the flavors can infuse. Then dump your pasta or your grains back in there, stir it around, and give that a try. It's just a great way to try some different things, whether you choose to have that pasta to be um, a side dish or not. The idea is that they don't have so much flavor they're gonna drown out whatever's in the herb. And that way you can just try it. A great basis for a lot of things. The other thing I was going to share is that, since I don't have the handout, um, is that you can try, I have in here too, a little traditional herb guide, which tells you different types of foods that go with different, you know, herbs, which you could, you know, this is pretty basic. There's a lot more. I even have uh, fruit. You know, what herbs will go nicely with fruit or with different types of vinegar. So a lot of options for just playing around and trying some different things to be healthy. It's great. And I don't know as much about all the vegetables and their things, but with this, it's awesome. So I guess I'm pushing this little booklet for $6. <laughs> and, and if you really do want to know a lot more, you can give me a call through the month of March. I will either come to you or we can choose a place where I can do a Cooking with Herbs 406 class. And it's more like about an hour and a half. But this gives you some ideas. But the big thing I want to bring across is that you want to eat local. I mean, you know, eating local is so much fresher. And when you eat local, you're eating more seasonably. So that makes a big difference on your body too. Eating things at the right season does make a difference. Um, and the, the local food usually has more nutrients because it's just grown close by in our soil. I'm, I'm really a particular about that. I grow things sustainably. Um, 
I think that Montana's dirt, <laughs> water, and air is just the greatest for our plants. In fact, I learned something that was interesting. There are certain herbs that we can grow here that those in the southern states cannot grow. Go ahead. No problem. <laughs> so, and vice versa. One thing I learned is because of our more extreme climate, many times our herbs are not as big and fluffy. But you know what? They're a lot, they're more compact and more potent. So, you know, don't complain. <laughs> it's good. It's all good. Um, but the other thing I was going to say, and of course it's fresher because it doesn't, like for instance, fruit. They usually pick fruit before they're ripe and they, they have it figured out how long it's gonna take, whether they're flying it or whether they're trucking it from how far, so that when it gets to the grocery store, it should be ripe or close to ripe. Um, but a lot can happen with all those miles. Now we're getting into the whole environment thing because that's the other thing. The footprint is ridiculous. And so if you can learn to eat local, it really makes a big difference just in the um, environment and our economy here, it's just the best. And the other thing about it is that if you eat locally, you know, of course I'm a big deal in that I love, I've been both at the Missoula Valley winter market as well as the Clark Fork summer market. I don't really have to grow veggies, I could, but I actually believe in all the vendors there, so that's where I get my veggies. Sometimes I'll just go to one of those stands and go, Oh, I don't know if I've tried that before. So I'll make a meal around it for next week. I'll plan that into my, you know, what I've got going. Pretty easy and something new and fun to learn about. What might go well with it. Um, you know, how to cook it and all that type of thing. But the other thing is, so I can, and I have, gone up to those farmers and say, now how do you grow these things? You know, so you can find out exactly, do they use pesticides? Do they use fertilizer? And if so, is it natural or is it organic? You know, how much machinery do they use? You know, all those kinds of things. I mean, I realize that bigger farms have to use some machinery, but I just think it's great that you can choose. You can choose what farmer you get your food from. I think it's awesome. Um, let's see if I've got, oops, sorry, one more pick that might be good. If I do it right. Oh, this is just, you know, being able to grow your own. There are a lot of things that you can actually um, grow indoors. This is, um, I have to bring certain plants in. And of course, I do start things like basil indoors uh, tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be doing that type of thing because we are in Montana after all. But the reason I have this picture here, I couldn't find my, my uh, kitchen garden because we just uh, remodeled last year and <clears throat> my kitchen garden was taken away. So <laughs> this is older stuff. But it's so nice to have, even in the winter, you can have, there are certain things that will grow fine in the winter. Some things you might be able to well, grow better in the winter in pots and then have to choose to reseed in the summer. So it's vice versa. But in Montana, for instance, I always have to bring in my rosemary. And up here, I think I've got pineapple sage, which I, <laughs> which I have in what's called my hangover tea. <laughs> but you know, there's such a thing where, the other thing about having something indoors, if you have just a few grow lights, since we don't have a lot of sun in the summer, it's great to work in there. Go in there and sit with a book if you want to. <laughs> just to have a little more sunlight and remember how plants work they take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen so having plants in your home is just so healthy for your lungs it's pretty nice and then uh, one more picture here I don't know how to do this right so it's kind of like okay this is a picture of uh, the first things that I can usually harvest in the spring. It's amazing how many times these things will come up and grow before I even get the sprinkler system started. 
it also amazes me after you know studying and using medicinal herbs for tea how many of the native plants that um, are around that come up really early they really work on sniffles allergies all the things that happen in the spring it's like god put those plants there for a reason it's awesome so that's something that i also want to explain is that you want to be able to maybe grow some of your own herbs maybe not even for instance thank god most of us don't it's tempting but don't spray our dandelions oh my gosh that is just a storehouse of all sorts of medicines who knew the flowers the leaves the roots they all do awesome things another thing that i don't have on here but i did have on my print uh the last thing i put was psyllium Did anybody know what psyllium is it is basically the seeds from the plantain plant Plantain is this broadleaf thing that most of us consider a weed that grows profusely almost everywhere. But the seeds, psyllium is in a lot of uh, weight loss things. It helps your digestion. It pulls toxins out. It makes you more regular. Amazing, a weed, the seeds from a weed. It's pretty cool. So if you, if you eat local and you use certain herbs with your food, then it's going to take away inflammation in your body and it's going to balance your microbiome. And to me, it just seems like if you can grow your own, awesome. I mean, of course I'd love you to come buy my stuff, but you know, to have your own, you would know exactly what you did to grow that food. So that can be really good. Or you have to learn to trust, you know, people, ask your farmer. And that's, that was the main thing that I wanted to uh, share today. So go get yourself some seeds and grow some versatility. <laughs> but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I'll clap too. But I still have a little bit of time to answer some questions. So fire away at me. Anything that we've covered? Yes. <clears throat> no, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. Yes, I had a 15-year-old palm tree, uh, ginger palm, that about two weeks ago I finally cut down. Because it will only, oh, I mean, I could put it out in my greenhouse. I bought it in Portland, and somehow it survived 15 years, but it never looked wonderful. You know, it was this tall with a lot of yellow on it. I think that I would have to, this is the thing, you might have to have more of a, I do know people that have tropical greenhouses. I just don't do that. Turmeric's the same way. Where it comes from, you'd have to have just, I even, with cumin, I just love cumin. You have to have the seeds very wet for six months in exactly, well, 72 to 78 degrees. And some of that gets a little bit too much for me. So I now have a new friend that might grow some of these things for me <laughs> so they can all be local that I get. But those two items, and it's too bad because turmeric is awesome. And I know that um, the best, I know of two things that are really good. Of course, you know how good celery is for you. And lovage is basically the cousin to celery. Celery seed is a really great anti-inflammatory. So is lovage. Uh, these, these little leaves right here that are going up tall, that's, those are lovage right there. And um, that could be a little bit more of a substitute for turmeric. Um, the other thing is in uh, traditionally medicinal herbs, meadowsweet, which we have meadowsweet herbs. Um, it's a really nice bush. It's really pretty little umbrella-like flowers on it and it is a great anti-inflammatory. So there are those things that you can do. They don't have as much flavor as turmeric. They don't stain as much, but <laughs> those are some ideas of how you might, you know, make something a little bit different. Okay, did that spur anybody else or anybody else have some questions? Nothing. Okay. 
Yes, I, I have some horseradish growing. And that's kind of in my heart row, I call it, because it's really good for your heart and a lot of other things. But yeah, you have to be kind of careful with it. It will spread forever. So. I just have bad luck to be growing. Yeah, sometimes it, it doesn't take, it took me a couple years to get it to grow. And then it came up like the third year in between a bunch of other wheat. So, you know, who knows? Yes. How do you keep your herbs from spreading forever? Do you have them plant mostly in containers? No. No, that first picture, um, I don't know how clear it is. Not very because of all the mist. But um, my garden's set up in my front yard and it's uh, 12 main rows, kind of like a chevron. And it has grass in between, so four foot grass paths, four foot, you know, of the, and I am, Mints, sometimes I've got to dig up out of my grass. Um, Heartsease, there's a few different things that I have to dig up. But I use, um, like my, one of the things I do is most of my mints are planted like underneath that tree so that, you know, it might have more pine needles in its soil, you know, just to slow down the growth a little bit. But um, yeah, it just is work because you've got to be able to, you know, just like you weed, you have to sometimes catch those plants. If I can, depends on how dense the grass is, where they are. You know, I'll dig them up and put them back in the bed or, you know, that kind of thing. That answer? Yes. Um, good question. I like perennials because once you grow them, they're done. And my favorite herb is thyme. I think it grows really easily. Um, I do start that indoors too. You know, I start my perennial herbs and then two weeks later I start my annual herbs because they'll catch up. You know, just because the perennials grow a lot slower. And then they go out to the greenhouse in, for the month of May. And then I never plant out in my garden until the second week of June. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever noticed that Memorial Day can be really poopy a lot of times? <laughs> so everybody thinks that's when you're, you know, that summer starts at Memorial Day and that's when you plant things. No, not here in the Northwest, really. It's not the best, best choice. So that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, how I work with that. And with the herbs, I just feel so bad that you guys don't have, you can come over and read that page if you want to, just to give you some more ideas. And especially, uh, another one that's very easy to grow and does spread is wild marjoram, which is, which is garden oregano. You know, there's, I only grow two different oreganos. The other one being Greek, which is the pizza herb. And the pizza herb, it turns out that wild marjoram is actually more medicinal than the pizza herb. One of the things about oregano is it's antifungal, antibacterial. It does, it's great. Well, in general, I will say that almost all of the herbs, they started out as medicinal way back, you know? And as, as time went on, they've all, all of them are good for digestion and many of them are really good antibiotics. So that's the other big simple thing about herbs that's so awesome. But with oregano, for instance, once you get that going, it grows and grows and grows. So it's a, my bumper crop every year. That's why I have some um, wreaths made out of <laughs> oregano because it's just, you know, you can use it everywhere. Oh, good question. And I took that picture down because it wasn't very good, but it, there is a little bit of a secret to that because a lot of the pictures that you see, you see these big clumps of things hanging from the ceiling and they look beautiful. However, practically speaking, they're probably kind of moldy in the middle. So I, my little rule of thumb, I use uh, either wires or those metal shelving units and that's what I couldn't find a picture of. When I, um, after I harvest these things, I will, my rule of thumb is three, th 
three, five, seven, or nine stems. And the reason why is because at the, at the top of the stems, you know, you want the stems somewhere like around this long, what you can. And then you don't want it to be any bigger than three eighths to a half of an inch. And I just use black rubber bands and toothpicks and hang them. That's how I do it. And what's nice about that is that they will probably, depending on the herb, but a lot of them will, will dry pretty well within a week. In July, it might be a few days, you know, or August. Um, and importantly, with hanging herbs too, and I found this out last year because of the remodeling project, I didn't have where I usually have, um, better to, to uh, dry them in dark rather than light. Um, I had a screen porch, I had screens, but I found that things kind of turn yellow before they dry. Because normally they should, you know, still be nice and, you know, green. So that's some other tips on, you know, anytime you harvest herbs, just do small, do, you know, wherever you can do it. If you've got a closet indoors, you know, hang them from some sort of a string somewhere where you've got a little bit of room. I both, long time ago, I hung mine underneath the stairs, <laughs> you know, because there's room. I could put some things there. I even tried growing tomatoes there. Wasn't successful, but I did. Um, what else? Anything else? Uh, freezing herbs is good, is a great thing, but there are one thing that I don't grow a lot of, and it's because of they don't freeze well and they don't dry well, is sweet basil. You know, the nice big fluffy leaves. If you dry them or freeze them, they kind of turn black. If you put basil in oil, people have said they've been able to freeze it successfully. No, not too good. You, they lost all their flavor, which is another little thing to know about herbs. Fresh or dried, even though a lot of recipes say different, but especially fresh herbs, the best thing to do is to add them to your, your uh, recipe at the end. You know, just like you would with spinach, you know, so that um, you still have the flavors and they don't get overboiled. Okay, I think that helps a little bit on that. Oh, what? Yeah. Right. All <laughs> right, yeah, that's the, that's the other problem. Right now I have a lot of ginger in my freezer because I read that I can do that before I process. A lot of the roots, like dandelion roots, um, I just wash them when they're fresh. And then I use a potato peeler, you know, to make kind of thin, which I'll, I did a, with the ginger also. And then I dry it in my oven because my oven will get down to 150 and it takes a couple of hours. But that way I can um, have more dried herbs for my blends and that type of thing, you know, to use more that way. But freezing is nice if it works because then it's going to be fresher. But have you frozen tomatoes? Well, I've processed them and then frozen them. Yeah, yeah. Like, they're okay, but, um, you know, they kind of get mushy. And that's kind of what happens with a lot of the herbs. Certain ones are a lot hardier when you freeze them. But I'll be honest with you, there are many um, culinary herbs. Thyme is one, um, actually oregano and Greek oregano. They actually have more flavor after they dry. So, you know, that's something to be aware of too. But there's other things like regular sweet basil doesn't taste anything like sweet basil once it's... Now, when you buy it in the store, they usually freeze dry it, and I think that's probably better. I just don't want to get into all that. <laughs> but, you know, so at home it might be kind of a weird thing to do. Yes. I pretty much sell all my dried herbs from last year's harvest by the time I start harvesting. It's kind of my thing. I'll put them in the compost pile. I really believe in the idea of them being 
you know, very fresh. I mean, supposedly they have a three-year shelf life, but I don't think that's true for getting the best potency, so. And I'm just about out of all my herbs, so obviously it works. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Sold them all. Well, you guys, I really appreciate, hopefully, I gave you a little bit of something to think about and come over to my booth and you can kind of thumb through this if you'd like or take it home if you want to just get ideas. <laughs> I'm really into the whole practical thing. Can you tell by some of the things I choose to do and don't? Um, this is put together so if you want to go to some of these recipes, you can uh, pull this off and, and, then, and then put it over the recipe so it won't get all splattered. You know, just splatter proof, I guess you might say. So easy to, you know, stand up against something <laughs> and use. So thanks so much for your time. I sure appreciate it. All righty. This is our second presentation by Paul Buck, who's a master gardener and has got lots of experience saving seeds at high elevation. He's uh, saved seeds here and in Colorado. So if you have questions, you can ask him about that. And take it away, Rose. Thank you, Anna. Are you recording now? Thank you. Okay. Um, as Anne indicated, my name is Paul Buck. And uh, originally from Oklahoma, came here in 71 to go into forestry, ended up in microbiology, um, and then moved around the country. Then I spent 10 years in Colorado, in Gunnison, Colorado, at uh, 8,000 feet, and had gardens and so on, and, and uh, it was truly amazing. Um, we had very little problems with bugs, but the first year I was there, the growing season, our last killing frost was June 17th, and our first crawling, 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 killing frost was August 9th. So I thought, what am I doing here? But, but it's amazing though, in the 10 years I was there, um, our growing season, and there was a guy there that was following the climate and so on, he was, he was um, charting the last killing frost and the first one, and it was, we, in the 10 years we got an extra week of growing season, and it, now it's up to a couple of weeks now, longer than, right. anyway. Um, Seed saving basics, basically what I'm going to do is kind of go through some of the basic information about what you need to know to make the decision to save seeds. And I'll leave you with some questions about um, what you need to ask yourself to say, okay, do I want to save the seeds of this particular crop? And it, it, there's a big difference there. Um, I'll go through some of the pollination and so on, but if you haven't seen this book and you want a good read and learn about pollination and so on in, the, in, in uh, plants, it's really a great book. The funny thing about it, I think, is it was written by Angela Overy. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I don't know whether she changed her name. Or uh, she thought, well, I have this name, I'll write this book. But anyway, it's actually a good book. Um, so let's get started. Let's see. Okay. Why save seeds? Um, plant morphology, a little bit about plant structure and what you have to look for. And then the process of saving seeds. I don't know if my clicker is going to do it. Yeah, it's not going to do it. Yeah, it's just hit the... Okay, why save seeds? Number one, and these aren't in any particular order, it's economical, little to no cost to actual um, save the seeds and preserve them. Um, most everything you can get is um, preserved genetic diversity, available to um, many gardeners. As you've probably heard, we're losing genetic diversity in the world, and the more gardeners can um, raise their own crops and have their own different 
diversity, um, the better off we are. Especially with our changing climate, because the, the crops we grow, grow now, um, some of them we won't be able to in the future. Others, you know, we'll be able to start growing other crops that we couldn't before. Select plants that grow and produce best in your garden. Um, as you probably know that all of our gardens have little microclimates. And within your garden too, there are little microclimates. And so the placement of the seeds and what of the plants and what you choose to grow is, is uh, varies greatly. Connect with your garden and plant community. It's great to talk with other people, you know, changing seeds, you know, and so on. Um, it's just, it's a great connection. Quality, flavor, nutrition is probably the one of the biggest reasons to uh, save your own seeds. And I say the Seminus bell pepper. I don't know if you're aware of that, but this bell pepper, which is sold a lot in the grocery stores, the main criteria they selected that pepper for, one was color, bright green. The other was um, longevity as far as being able to have shelf life. And anytime you start selecting a plant for a certain criteria, you're going to lose something else. And I think they lost a lot of flavor in these. Um, it's like a lot of the flowers that we have and, and grow, a lot of the flowers that have more petals on them, they've been selected for that, like roses and so on. But at the same time, they're losing the, the flowers don't want to produce as much pollen and nectar. And so if you look, a lot of the, flower, the roses that, um, the varieties that are out there, there aren't many bees on them. But if you look at the native rose, the woods rose, I mean, the bees are all over it. And part of the selection. Okay, where do we start? And I, I worded this strangely to make you think about from what crop do I want to save, se save seeds and from where will the cop crop come? I do that on purpose. So you have to look at what you're starting with because the crop, the seeds you're going to save, you have to grow the crop and then save the seeds. But where are you starting? Start with good seeds, grow in the previous, previous year, and with the characteristics you want. Okay, I want to say something here. These are my favorite um, seeds that I start with. Johnny's, which we're all familiar with, is out of Maine, and I know they grow a lot of their seeds in Maine and the Northeast. Um, Triple Divide, which is a Montana company. Um, Seeds Trust, you can't see it there very well. That's out of Colorado, Longmont, Colorado, and they actually grow their seeds in Colorado, all across eastern and western Colorado, you know, at 5,000 feet. And a climate much like ours. Um, I would not start with a lot of the seeds that are out here if you're going to save them for yourself and propagate them year after year. Um, like one of the seeds companies that's out there, I was, uh, they were from Broomfield, Colorado. And so I thought, ah, you know, this is when I lived in Gunnison at 8,000 feet. And I thought, ah, these would be great seeds to save, you know, for my climate. And I went and talked to the, happened to run into the guy that owns it, and he says, no, nah, we don't have any fields. We just, we're just a warehouse. And um, I said, well, where do your seeds come from? Well, they come from all over. He says, we get some seeds from Israel, California. So you don't know where the plant grew that, these seeds came from. And so I always start with good, good seeds. Okay, parts of the flower, basically male, female, um, parts that we look at, the stigma, it, well the pistil, of course, is the female part of the flower, comes down, ovary with the seeds, and I'm just going to, it's very basic so that when you get a little further in, You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, the male part is the anther and the stamen, and that's where the, the pollen comes from. So this is called a complete, a complete flower in the sense that it has both male and female parts. Next one. 
Now, when you look at the formation of a, of a seed and the fruit, you got to remember the fruit is the whole part of the, the fruit encapsulates the seed. You know, we kind of mix those terms up sometimes. But anyway, you can see um, with an apple, we have um, the basic seed is made up of the, the seed coat and then the cotyledon and the radical. Those are the three main parts. The radical is going to be the root. The cotyledon will grow up and be the first. They're not real true leaves, but they what get the uh, or provides energy for the seedling. There are some plants where the cotyledon did not emerge. It's still in the ground. I think peas. Uh, I can't remember. Um, anyway, but the energy that is in those cotyledons is the energy that the seedlings grow with. Okay, comparing an apple with the flower and the fruit, you can see the, uh, let's start at the bottom, the pedicel, what is connecting the flower to the stem, it also connects the fruit to the stem. The ovules, where the seeds are formed, um, on, a, on a complete complete flower to have both male and female again. Um, the ovules come down from the stigma, the pollen goes down through the pistil into the ovary and that's where the, the uh, eggs are, German, are uh, fertilized. Uh, let's see, stigma style, we went through that. Um, you could see the, the stamen and the styles on an apple. I always wondered, well, years ago, I was wondering what this little part of the, on the other end of the apple is, and it, it's actually part of the, the flower. Um, next slide. Okay, fruit comes in many different sizes. Um, these, it takes a tremendous amount of work to grow one of these. They pick a plant, of course, they have the seeds from the previous year. This is part of, a, a, the main part of how they grow these large pumpkins is to get the right seeds, the right genetics. And so they'll plant, and then they only grow one pumpkin per, seed, per plant. And you can see how much energy it takes and a heck of a lot of water. Next. And then uh, native seeds are coming, or fruit comes in different sizes. Um, next. Okay. One of the first question is, is what type of flower does the plant that I want to save the seeds from have? And we're looking at plant reproduction here. A complete flower has both male and female. An incomplete flower as male or female. So those are the key things to remember. Then we look at what does the plant have? Does it have just female or just male or both? Monoecious is both male and female flowers, flowers on the same plant, such as squash, cucurbits. They'll have both male and female different flowers. Dioecious, male and female on separate plants by, and spinach is an example. The reason I bring this up is, you know, if, if you go out there and you say, okay, I want to save the seeds from spinach, and you say, okay, we'll let this one grow up. Well, it's not going to work if it's just male or just female. So you have to have more than one spinach plant to get your seeds. Okay, next slide. How's a flower pollinated? Again, for most of you, this is probably just old hat. Self-pollinating, not common or most effective. Um, very few plants are really self-pollinating. Um, it's interesting, you'll get a plant that is um, a complete flower, both male and female, but on that one flower, the pollen that comes from that flower cannot fertilize the eggs in that same flower. 
they have to go to, and, and broccoli is like this, that it has to go to a different plant. Um, pollination by animals, um, insects, bees, wasps, flies, butterflies, whole bit. We have, in Montana, we have most all of those except for bats. I don't, does anybody know we have any bats that Do we have bats that pollinate? Yeah, we have bats, but I can seek there. So, anyway, um, one thing I'll say here is that wasps, you know, a lot of people think that wasps are deleterious or not good, but they actually do quite a bit of pollination. And they will um, actually, they have some of the same habits that bees do. The only thing about wasps and some of these others is that they're not looking for the pollen. They're looking for the sugar for themselves. They don't use the pollen like bees do to, um, for their young. So their effectiveness as far as pollination goes is a lot less. Um, wind, for the most part, the uh, produce that we grow, the wind is not an effective uh, pollination. Hand uh, pollination, I bring that up because um, tomatoes are one that you can do. And then the cucurbits, which we'll get into later, is, is another thing that you can hand pollinate with and use as, as an effective tool. Next slide. Okay, cross pollination. Many related plants will cross pollinate and you have to look at your garden and say, okay, if I'm going to save um, spaghetti squash here and I have a, um, some other kind of squash over here, well, there's a good chance there could be cross pollination. And so as you're thinking about what you want to save, the seeds you want to save, you have to take that into consideration. Um, and you also have to look outside your own garden. If you have a neighbor that's got a bunch of squash, you know, um, take that into consideration. There are things you can do, and we'll go through that in a second. Um, plants that are mostly, yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's how they get gourds, yeah, is by cross-pollinating them, you know. They'll just say, okay, let's try this and this and what comes out, you know. Um, and that's another case where when you're selecting like a gourd, they put all their energy into the, the shell and so on, and, and the, the fruit is not edible. And so the, the plant makes these, make these decisions, but, um, and you just come out with different results. Uh, plants that are, again, mostly pollinated by insects will, will be cro cross-pollinated to a greater extent. It's those little bees and so on that you've got to watch out for. Um, I, I thought this was really cool. The seedless watermelon was, cre and I always wondered how they propagated it. So what they do is take watermelon seeds and soak them in a, it's called colchicine. It's a chemical that causes those seeds to be, um, to go from, let's see, where is it? To go, to go from having two sets of genes to having four sets. And then they cross a plant that has four sets of genes with a regular watermelon that has two sets. The result is a watermelon that has three sets of genes They'll grow just like any other watermelon will grow, except the seeds are non-viable. So they don't grow inside the watermelon. You'll see the little white ones sometimes. And anytime you see a white seed, most likely it's not viable. So I thought that was an interesting side light. Okay, watch the plant life cycle. Again, this is probably all old hat to you. Annual germinates, grows, produces seeds, and dies in one year. Squash, um, by, um, perennial, lives for more than two years and flowers most every year. Strawberry, but for the most part, we, or at least I don't, um, save seeds on perennials because for the most part, the germination or the propagation is through rhizomes and, and so on. A biennial, 
is a plant that the flowering takes place in two years. Um, the first year the plant grows the leaves, usually sets a, a rosette or, or just the basic leaves of the plant. Um, and then the next year it will send up the stalk with the flowers. And again, you have to think of this, you know, because if you don't think about it and say, oh, I'm going to grow some carrots and save the seeds. Well, you throw them out and you're not going to get seeds the first year. Um, same thing with onions. Okay. Next slide. Which plants do I save seeds from? To look at the criteria for what you want. Um, rapid germination. How fast does that plant germinate? Flavor, color, vegetative growth, delayed bolting. This is a big one and it's gonna get bigger as we get hotter. Um, plants are gonna bolt much quicker in the heat. Um, so if you have one that, um, if you have a plant, well, let's think of say spinach and you have a bunch of spinach plants and you notice that a bunch of them are bolting real quick, but you have some in there that aren't bolting, that might be a good one to um, save, cut the flowers and, and um, stems off the other spinach and then let that one go and uh, select it for its delayed bolting. Uh, good flower fruit production. I, the ones that uh, when I'm saving, and I don't save all my plants every year, um, like peas, uh, sweet peas. I'll watch as they grow during the, during the season and look for larger fruit, uh, more seeds per pod, larger seeds per pod, um, and then I'll take a, a piece of string wrapped around that pod and uh, save as many as I want. Um, disease resistance, um, again, right now as far as my gardening is concerned, I haven't had a lot of problems with disease. Mostly insects, uh, disease I'm thinking of um, mold and, and uh, viruses and so on, I haven't had a lot of problem there. But that will probably change again with the changing climate. Um, insects, um, yeah, I don't know about most of you, my, my main problem has been aphids and then the, the flea beetle. Does anybody have a problem with the little, little tiny black flea, flea beetle? Yeah, I got some, I mean they're just little tiny, tiny things and they're extremely hard to get uh, rid of, but um, yeah, next one. Okay, as I mentioned before, identify plants, branches, flowers that you want to save. Um, a, a good thing about saving seeds is that it's important to watch your plants carefully over the whole growing season. You know, I have a tendency, if I'm not saving the seeds, I'll go out and say, oh, I got a weed here, and I'm weeding and I don't even look at the plant and I come back a few days later and say, where did that tomato come from? You know, it's been there the whole time. Um, it's forced me to, to watch the and watch the plants a lot more careful. Um, yeah, and identify which flower you want to see. Just a little louder. A little louder? Okay. Um, save seeds from more than one plant and more than one flower. Because you never know when the seeds you might take from one flower are even viable. So you want to get a good selection of, of uh, seeds. Save it for more than one plant. I save enough seeds, like if I'm doing spinach or um, peas or onions, I will save enough seeds for three years because I don't use my seeds that are more than three years old for the most part. Lettuce is one thing. I've, we got some lettuce here from 1919, 2014. And I threw them out in my garden and about half of them germinated. So, but for the most part, I don't, I don't save um, seeds after three years. And so I tell myself, okay, I'm gonna have this crop for three years and then I'll save them after three years so that I can rotate what I save and it, it's, it's a little time consuming sometimes saving seeds. So, next one. 
Okay, how are seeds processed and stored? Um, first of all, let's look at what causes seeds to either germinate or decompose. Decomposition of the seeds or rotting is basically due to fungus for the most part. And there you want to control the moisture and the temperature. Germination, development of a plant from a seed, factors in germination, we look at dormancy. For the most part, all the seeds that we will have in a vegetable garden do not need to be dormant um, from the time that they're selected till the time they can be planted. Um, a lot of native plants need that, but for the most part, um, vegetable seeds do not. Moisture, again, moisture gets back to if it's too moist and too warm, it'll germinate or it'll decompose. So you want to control the amount of moisture. They need to be dry enough to where if you take the seed and it'll crack, but yet it's not stone dry or, or I don't know how to describe it. Um, and it, some seeds that are round, you know, like spinach, what I do is, is to see if they're dry enough. I'll take one and, and smash it on the table, and it will actually crumble into pieces to know whether it's, it's uh, dry enough to save. Temperature, um, they need to be stored 20 to, well, I'm thinking centigrade. Um, 40 degrees, somewhere in there. It's the best temperature um, to save the seeds. I, I have a tendency just to throw mine out in an unheated garage, and I found that to be very successful as far as, yeah. Is the fridge too moist? That's about the right temp. Um, problems with fridge is that you have to have them real clean, and I'll get that to a second, um, because uh, there's a lot of mold that will grow at 40 degrees, and the moisture in most refrigerators is way too high. Then, to put them in the fridge, you have to seal them, and that brings up other problems. So, for the most part, no, it's not. Either, if you're gonna, if you're gonna keep them cold, you gotta go way cold, like minus 20, in a completely sealed um, container to, to keep them viable freezing. Um, oxygen, is necessary for seeds because there's a certain amount of metabolism that goes on in seeds as they're sitting there. And so they need just a tiny bit of oxygen to, um, to maintain themselves. Light. No, no. Um, I use, I don't have one with me. I use pill bottles a lot. But with your a pill bottle is actually the lid, the lid, the lid is not sealed down. It just shakes enough, and there's enough oxygen that, and air that moves through there to, to satisfy the seed. And that's why most of them you'll see in, in uh, paper wrappers or paper containers allows that oxygen to move back and forth through. Um, light, no light. Again, light's needed for a lot of germination, not all, but um, in a dark, cool, um, dry spot. Scarification, for the most part, I don't think, um, beets sometimes helps to, to, what I do is just take a piece of sandpaper, throw the seeds out and just back and forth like that real quick. That's enough to break that seed coat. They'll still germinate, but it takes a lot longer. And uh, I'm usually not that patient to, toy till they germinate. So a lot of native plants you got a scarification though. Next one. Okay. Let the mature let the mature. Let the seeds and the fruit mature on the vine as much as you can. If you think about it, um, you know, the fruit's hanging down um, and as it matures it's still getting nutrients from the plant as those seeds are, are maturing and drying out. And so it's always best to leave it on there. Um, tomatoes, for instance, if, you, if like I get to the end of the season and um, gonna freeze, I'll take the whole tomato plant out of the ground, 
you know, cut the roots off and then hang it upside down. And that way, the nutrients within the stems and the leaves and so on will drain down and into the tomatoes and help them mature um, faster. Or um, don't dry in temperatures over 90 or in direct sunlight when you're drying your seeds because um, there's a lot of variation in UV light impact on seeds. You know, you can take seeds that are out in the desert, they can be laying, like the, the California poppies, can be laying out in the desert, full sun, 100 and some degrees for years, and then the right conditions come along and they bloom. Whereas if you took a, uh, probably a spinach seed or in most vegetables, if you left them out there, they, they're probably not viable. Um, what kind of fruit, um, whether it's fleshy, apple, squash, I find that as long as I separate the seeds out mostly from the rest of the fruit, the, the meat of the fruit, and put them on a uh, paper towel, that's adequate. Some people say you have to clean them and, and wash them and so on, but I, I've, I've never done that. E even with the tomatoes, I'll, you know, core it, take the seeds out, just kind of smear it out, let it dry, and then try and pick the seeds off. Even if I get a little bit of paper towel with it, that's fine too. And I've had great success that way. Um, I'll just, yes? I'm sorry, didn't hear you? Um, food, the question was about a food dehydrator. You just got to be careful that you don't over dry them and cook them. Even at 100, 100, 110, you can cook them. Do they? Um, yeah, I, I, I've never done it. Um, I'd have to give it a try. Yes? Doing what? For drying seeds to eat. Eating seeds? Yeah, or, that's what the like pumpkin? Seed setting. Ah, yeah. that's a good point. She indicated that she thinks that setting is for drying the seeds that you're going to eat, like pumpkin seeds and other things. So that's a good, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> okay. I, 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 yes? Um, I, a problem that I've had the last couple of years with beans and peas is that they simply don't dry on the vine. Can you do the same thing as with the tomatoes, just pull up the yeah. plant and hang them? Hmm. Your peas don't dry on the vine? I don't know why. They just keep staying green. <laughs> oh, you're talking of, okay, I'm, I'm thinking of sweet peas, uh, sugar peas. But you're talking about... Um, well, like sugar snap peas yeah. or original beans. And I want to save them for seeds. Those are, thank you for bringing that up. Those are a different type of pea. I'm thinking of the sugar snack, of uh, the uh, sweet pea that you eat the whole thing. Yeah. Um, mine, will, mine will just, the whole plant will start drying and, um, well, and the pot. Yeah. Patience. Yeah, I guess so. If they get frozen, then you have to do it. Yeah. 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 And I know that. Um, You know, the peas that you shell, shell peas, um, those are a little different. You have to get them when, when you think the pea inside, in, inside the pod is, is mature. And then you have to dry them outside the pod. Okay, that's, that's a good point there. Does that make sense? The different kinds of peas? Okay. Um, again, for when seeds are adequately dry, they'll break. Or, or bent when pressed on a hard surface. Separating from chaff, um, for the most part, I don't worry about that too much. Um, and, and some plants, like lettuce, it's almost impossible to see, to separate lettuce seeds from the chaff. You do the best you can, but then this gets back to making sure that what you're saving is dry enough 
and it's kept in the right conditions because the more chaff you have in there, the greater the possibility of fungal growth is. I mean, it skyrockets. Um, so, um, yeah, most, most of the time there's, the seeds I save, there's no problem with, with chaff and so on. Um, what, what is another one that might be? Yeah, mostly lettuce is the one you might have a problem with. Okay. Okay. Um, when I lived in Colorado at 8,000 feet, I grew quinoa. And uh, I'd have a, about a 14 by 14 um, bed of quinoa. And I get 20 pounds of quinoa out of it. And so I, did, I followed what they do in the Andes is you just go along. When the quinoa, when the, it's not a grain, uh, when the seeds start to fall off, just before they do, you cut it off and you lay it out. We take sheets and lay it out on the sheets and let it dry in the sun. Of course, in Colorado, that was a lot of sun. Um, but then there's a lot of chaff in there. And um, what Samus is referring to is I went online and, and in this whole process, going online and looking is great, except you have to be careful of who you're watching and what they're saying. Anytime I see an idea about planting or growing something, some guy will say, oh, I'll save the world, you know, I'll grow the best things. I always check around. A lot of times it's like, this guy's a little off. But anyway, I found on, um, online this contraption I built where you pour the seeds in the top and you hook a vacuum cleaner to it, and the seeds will drop down one side and it pulls the chaff off on the other side just different ways of sorting the seeds. I haven't, I've used it maybe here, sorting some seeds here sometimes, but for the most part, the amount of seeds that I save for my garden, I don't need it. But going through 20 pounds of quinoa really helped. And yeah, and you can, you can do things, if you have chaff, you can, you know, hold it up, drop it kind of below, use the wind, you know. I, uh, I was coriander. Um, was trying to save the seeds in coriander, so I built a table, and the seeds are kind of round, and so I made the tub a little rough, and poured it on there, and the seeds rolled down, but the, most of the chaff got stuck on the rough table. Um, just a whole variety of things, so. Okay, are the seeds viable when you're, when you go to collect them? Get probably old, uh, old uh, information to you. Color is one. These are actually uh, not a vegetable. These are the Cleome or Rocky Mountain bee plant that I have over there. If you want some seeds, they've got a whole bucket of them. But anyway, if you look at them, there's dark brown blackish ones and white ones. Which ones do you think are viable? The dark ones, right. And we see that too in pumpkin and pumpkin and watermelon. You know, you open a watermelon up, bunch of black seeds, those are probably viable, the white ones aren't. Um, interesting thing about this one is as the, as the season went on and the bees started disappearing, I'm talking into September and October, um, on my Cleome plants I got more and more white seeds because the bees weren't around to, to pollinate them. Um, color, shape, and um, texture. Any seed that's uh, like pumpkin seed, uh, cucurbit seed, look at them all. If you have a flat one, it's no good. Um, some of the some of the spinach, you know, the, sp the variety of spinach I have is a very, um, it's almost a pointed little spikes on the on the seeds and so on. Um, I'll go through those and if I have one that's smooth and looks a lot different, I discard it. Because you want to make sure that the seeds you're saving for your next year crop are um, as good as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
Right. Right. We'll go into that in just a second. Okay. So is that making sense? All these questions, you ask yourself, okay, do I want to save this squash or spinach or lettuce or tomatoes or whatever? And then answer these questions. Does that plant, can I save those seeds from that plant? Based on these questions. Okay, next one. Process packaging, we went through this a little before. Paper, um, pill bottles, but it cannot be airtight. Uh, protect from pests. Well, that's just common sense. But that's one thing that's nice about the pill bottles. I just throw them out in the garage and I don't worry about if I had mice. In Colorado, um, I threw a bunch of seeds out and they weren't there in the spring. Um, label the container so that you know what you planted, what you were looking for. Um, so that way you can keep down the years as you're, as you're saving the seeds on this particular produce, you can compare it, see what's changing, see what's, um, what you want. And again, back, where did the original seeds come from? Make a note of that so that you can share things. Like um, a friend of mine, live up 23rd, she um, came up with a Roma, an Italian Roma, where each fruit was a pound. I mean, these are just massive, really nice Roma. And so, um, she gave me some seeds and I've been propagating it ever since. And so I kind of, you know, keep the information and it's fun to share too. Next one. Process again, dry, low humidity, cool, 40 to 60 degrees. 60 is a little high, try and keep it um, lower. Uh, frozen again, tw minus 20 or less. Um, moisture and dark, we've already gone over that. Okay, let's look at some individual plants and saving them. Okay, squashed um, families, cucurbitaceae, it's a cucurbit. Um, there's a lot of different varieties, as we all know, of squash. And I put that up there because all of these can cross-pollinate. And so, like I mentioned before, you don't know what you're going to get if they cross-pollinate. Um, cross pollinate, yes. Flowers, monoecious. That means that separate male and female flowers on the same plant. And it's an annual. Next. Okay, so how do you prevent cross pollination here? What I do is, okay, tell me, which is the male and the female flower? Female? Great. Um, so you don't worry about the males. It's the female flower that you're worried about. What I do is when the flower is not quite this mature, it's still, the petals are still folded up kind of, they're kind of twisted up. I'll take a piece of uh, old stocking. Do, do women wear stocking like they used to? No. <laughs> Well, I used to, you know, you just go and grab a pair of stocking, cut it off, and you slip it over that flower and tie it, do it several f female flowers, and tie it off and let it um, mature. And so it will open up. It's got to be pretty loose. It will open up. No insects can get to it. And then once it's open and the uh, pistol is fully formed, you go over and you take the male flower with all the stamens, cut it off, pull the petals off, and then go around and you literally dust the female flower, take the top off and dust the female flowers. So that way you know what pollen is going to the female flower. It's pretty simple actually. And that way I don't care about if I have other, when I do, more than one squash plant around. Um, then put the netting back on because the bees are all over the place and there's that chance, it only takes one little pollen grain to blow the whole works. Um, put the netting back over, let that flower mature until it can no longer, uh, 
well, until it's basically died off. So, make sense? Yeah. It's really fun. It's a lot of fun to do. But how do you know, you know, that's the particular plant you want to save if it's the first year you're growing, you know, to go through all that trouble. I'm just thinking of this great pumpkin that I ate, which was delicious, and I saved all those seeds, but it's not going to be well, that, that pumpkin, is it? Oh, yeah, because we're, we're using pollen from that same plant or from another plant that came from the same seeds that it, that one was from. I know the history of this plant, and I'm not letting any Thing, get to that plant to cross pollinate it. Does that make any sense? Yeah, but I'm just thinking, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? If I buy some pumpkin seeds that sound like what I want. Well, that, that's, that's where I go to the companies that I know. That's why I start with known seeds. I get them from somebody else who, who knows, or I get them from, because I know that Johnny's, I know that. Seed Trust, and I know that Triple Divide is going to have true seeds. And so I protect that all the way through. So, okay? Okay, yes. And about the squash, now there's, there's like Maxima and Pepo and Machada. And I had read that they only cross with them, you know, the same ones. Like, so, so the Machadas will only cross with other Mishadas, but I'm wondering if that's true or not, or if all squash will cross with other squash. Um, I, I can't say 100%, but I don't take the chance. Yeah. I don't so take the reason I was asking, I, I actually grew out some seeds from a blue hover squash that a friend, a neighbor of a friend, you know, was passed down. And I grew three plants from the seeds from this squash. One of the plants grew me pink banana squash. <laughs> One of the plants grew me a what looks like a blue hubbard. And the third plant gave me a little butternut squash, which is a different kind. And I thought, that, that's... I didn't think that was supposed to happen. Well, she might have gotten her seeds mixed up, I or whoever well, gave them to you. Well, she gave me the a chunk of squash, so I know all the seeds came from. All the that one squash. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Well. But then there's been cross pollination that. Uh, obviously, yeah, a lot of kanky kanky going on in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why you know where you get your seeds from but, makes a huge yeah. difference. But that's interesting that they were so distinct. Three different yeah. yeah. Usually it's a some kind of goofy thing that kind of looks like a blue hubbard or, or spaghetti or something. Um, that's, a, that's really interesting. I haven't eaten the blue hubbard yet. We've, we've eaten one of the pink banana squash at the school. Did you know that most pumpkin you buy in the store in the cans is not pumpkin, it's blue hubbard? I didn't realize that. Most pumpkin you get in a can it's, it's a Blue Hubbard variety, it's not a regular pumpkin variety. You know, they're all kind of related, but um, I didn't realize that. And actually, from my experience, Blue Hubbard is a lot sweeter than regular pumpkin is. But the papita that I, it's K-A-J-A-I, Kajai or something like that. I got them from Johnny Seeds and um, all the, the the seeds are, you roast them and put a little salt or something on them or some kind of mixture. And uh, boy, they are wonderful. And the, all you do is just break it open, get the seeds out, lay them out, dry them, and you got a lot of snacks. So that's, that's my new. Um, broccoli, brassica, um, a lot of varieties. And again, these are all varieties of, of uh, the same genus. And for the most part, these will cross pollinate. Some of those will not, but um, you know, for instance, you can get a, what do they call it, Broca flower or, or something like that. That's just from cross pollinating. Um, flowers are complete. What I do, like for this year, I want broccoli. Any other brassica that I have, I'm very 
um, religious or observant about all the other brassica, when they, once they start bolting, I cut them immediately so that I know that there's no other brassicas around that can cross-pollinate. But then I know that nobody else has a garden um, close enough to mine to really worry about that. Okay. Um, broccoli is one where it will not, the seeds from one plant will not pollinate that same plant. How they do this, I have no idea. But you have to have more than one broccoli plant to pollinate. Is that making sense? Okay, the pollen from one plant will not. Okay. So that's how I take care of, of brassica. Um, next one. Okay, these are actually broccoli flowers. Um, you can see the, the bees love them, but again, um, I just, on this year that I took that picture, the only brassicas that I even let get close to flowering was the broccoli. So, next slide. Yeah, the problem one year I had with broccoli is that I planted it too late and it didn't mature to the um, flower stage and then on to uh, forming viable seeds. And so I had a bunch of seed pods, but none of them were viable because <laughs> too late in the season, mostly because the bees were all gone too. So spinach, um, amaranth ACE, uh, same family as quinoa is in actually. Um, Cross-pollinate, yes, but I don't worry about it because I, I've been using the same winter spinach for years, and again, nobody uh, around has any other kind of uh, spinach or amaranth around that um, will cross-pollinate. It's dioecious, which means that you have plants that are male, plants that are female. The male plants, of course, the pollen is, if you ever let spinach go to see, go to flower, the male, you take them and it's just, I mean, it's just thick. The pollen that comes off of it, it's worse than grass, or I'd say worse, but more pollen than you would if you shook grass. Um, so you gotta have both male and female. The, the male flowers will be on the stalk. The female flowers are kind of um, on the petioles where the, the leaves um, come off the stem. And there, that's actually very easy to save the seeds on spinach. Okay, next. That was my garden in Colorado. I was pretty lucky. You know, I had cattle. Let's see, on, on that ranch there were cattle, llama, sheep, horse, donkey. And so I had the best fertilizer you can think of. So, anyway, okay. So, any any questions? Um, I have one. Uh, we were kind of interested in um, collecting native seeds. So, can you speak about that? I know you've had some experience with that as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm growing a lot of. Well, I'm trying to grow native seeds now. Uh, this book, Sheila Morrison, is um, the guru, when you call her the guru, the guru of um, Native Plant. And do we have more of these books? Okay. Yeah, I've contacted the Native Plant Society to give this book. Um, one thing about uh, Native Plants is that it's actually illegal to just go out into any uh, national forest and so on and collect native seeds. Um, I, I will go out and I look for plants that are alongside the road and if I know that they're going to fall on the road, they'll never germinate, so I'll, I'll take them. But I just don't go out anywhere. Or on people's private property, you can collect those seeds too. But 
every plan is different. Some need to be scarified, some need to be cold at 40 degrees for three months, some need to be cold for a month, some need to freeze completely, some need light to germinate, some don't need light to germinate. Everything's different, and that's why this book is good. Um, can you get a special permit or something from the Forest Service? It just seems a shame with all that biodiversity up there and so close. Well, the problem is, is they have to limit it because people, it gets back to foraging too. Uh, people don't limit themselves. And so that's why I look for spots that, or go to private property that um, I know that that plant's not gonna make it. I'll, I'll, do, I'll go along Forest Service roads. And if you see a, a uh, Senecio, What's an ECO? Um, golden, golden? Okay, it's an it, it, It's one of the last um, flowering plants you'll see in the fall. It, it's yellow, no, oh, it's a yellow, it's, it's got a stalk. And um, if, if I see one that's fallen down and it's got a bunch of seeds on it, I'll take that. But, you know, for the most part, is that? Yeah, I just was not aware. Yeah, um, I won't say people don't do it, but if you do it, we'll look around first. <laughs> oh well, I know people in the forest. <laughs> okay, here, let's go. Okay, um, any other questions? Or Yeah. I don't know how to, I don't, it's, it's what you start with that counts. And so um, basically all seeds are hybrid in the sense of the seed companies are selecting for qualities and so they're constantly putting different um, plants together. Um, so yeah, I, I just don't even worry about that. And I, I just know what I start with and control the pollination of it. So if you got like a sun gold seed, oh, what? So if you got like a sun gold, you are like controlling it to an extent where you could save that seed Hybrid, uh -huh. and you're able to like replant that the next year with the same like traits. Um, should be. Like if you control the like pollination. Don't know. Now sun gold. What are you referring to? What was the plant you were? Oh, like sun gold. Oh, tomatoes. <laughs> It it should it should be true. If if as long as there's no cross pollination, and I forgot to talk about the the tomatoes, um, they they of course you probably already know this that the am I done? Okay, just one second here. Um, okay, two more slides. Resources, I mentioned that earlier, check your resources. Um, <laughs> extension offices are great. Minnesota's another great one. Next slide. Those are, that was 12 foot tall sunflowers. Got from a friend again, share your seeds. Next slide. Uh, Montana Native Plant Society, we have our annual plant sale June 1st at the River, um, Riverside Clark Fork um, Farmer's Market. Next slide. That's the Cleome that I have the seeds for over here. It's a wonderful plant to grow. You can do so many th different things with it. it it's, it's just a lot of fun. 
And the last slide is. Well, it didn't. The next slide was on climate change. Okay? It's my other passion. In every group I'm going to come to, I'm going to say vote. Support what's going on in your local, state, and federal levels as far as climate change is going. We gotta address it. I know a lot of people think, Ugh, and so I kind of feel the same way sometimes. Look at who we got the choices are. But climate change is changing the world now. Thank you. Okay, so this, uh, so first I'll introduce myself. My name's Elaine Chef. I own Green Path Herb School here in town. Used to own Meadow Sweet Herbs for about 18 years and now own a school we teach mostly adults about medicinal plants. So, um, and this presentation is actually a book that I wrote and you can download that off of our website. So. I won't be able to give you all the information. There's a bunch of recipes and medicine making kinds of information. So I'm going to pass this around. Um, or you can also just, I'll pass this around too, but you can just download it if you just, um, whatever, do that with your phone, <laughs> whatever that's called. Um, so let me pass these around for you guys, but encourage you to download the book. Um, and it has growing guidelines and everything. So it's a nice, it's a nice resource. Um, the other thing I'm going to pass around is we do have an Herbal Foundations program. This is a one-year, one Saturday a month program. It starts in April. So I'll pass that around if people are interested in that. And then the other thing that I'll let you know about is this summer in August, we are doing a, a second year of the Montana Herbal Festival. So this is a series of classes that happens over two days. A bunch of herb teachers come in. Um, last year it was here at the library. This year it's going to be over at Fort Mizzou, I'm sorry, at um, the fairgrounds uh, in the new building there, like the butterfly building and all their beautiful gardens. So I'll pass that around too if you're interested. I only have one of those, but good to know about. So I'll invite you to all of those things if you're interested. Um, this class is about 10 healing garden herbs. So we're going to talk about herbs that are easy to grow. I grow all of these in my garden here. So you can totally grow them in Montana. They're very, some of them are native. Some of them are just very uh, cold tolerant and that kind of thing. So good ones to grow. Um, we're going to start with a native. This is uh, Monarda fistulosa. And it's also called bee balm. It's also called wild oregano. Lots of different common names for it. Um, it is in the Lamiaceae family, which is the mint family. So all of our mint family plants have square stems and op opposite leaves, leaves that go straight across from each other. And bee balm is a wonderful, it's named bee balm because the bees love it, right? And I have a lot of native bees. I'm a beekeeper, so I, um, but I have also a lot of native bees and they adore the native bees like particularly love native plants right and so these uh, so bee balm gets a lot of native bees which is really wonderful for pollinators um, but it's also uh, like its name wild oregano it is um, medicinal and edible and so it has a really spicy flavor a lot like um, oregano right so this is kind of montana oregano if you will Right, so it has this lovely, it's very high in aromatic oils, which means it has a um, really distinctive smell. It smells a lot like oregano, and you can use it as a spice, just like you would use oregano. Okay, so um, anything, any herb that's high in volatile oils will usually have some kind of antimicrobial or antiseptic properties to it. And so this is very much the case with wild oregano. Um, it is a wonderful antiseptic and it's great topically. So if you're doing, and so one of the ways I used to love it is as a steam. So you can take the herb and usually dry it is a good idea. Um, fresh plants have a reaction to hot water. They wanna protect themselves, right? And so if it's a fresh plant, it's not going to give up its 
properties as easily if you put it in hot water. But what you, what you can do is you can put it in a hot pan of water, make sure uh, it can steam, but make sure it's not like boiling so it's not gonna burn your face. Put a towel over your head and then put the herb in there and then you breathe deeply. And it's a wonderful antiseptic for like throat infections, respiratory infections. It's also really nice for the skin. So if we have acne or, yeah, of course, um, if we have skin issues, uh, oregano can, because it's antimicrobial, it's antiseptic, it can help with that as well. It's great for a cough or cold, and I really like it at, uh, in um, honey for that. So, and I'll take the fresh herb and I'll just chop it up and put it in honey and let it infuse. And then you can strain that out after two weeks to a month. And you have this really nice herbal honey that then you can even just take a spoonful if you have like a sore throat or a cough, or you can add it to tea or something like that. It does encourage sweating and that's called diaphoretic. Same thing, it means it makes you sweat. And so that can be really helpful, especially if we're trying to break a fever or something like that. We're hot and we wanna cool off. If we encourage sweating or diaphoresis, that can help us cool down. Okay. If people have questions, let me know too. Yeah, so yeah, when please. You were saying, um, when you infused it, when you said yeah. you put the herb in, are you putting in the flower or the stem or the leaves? Or Great question, it? yeah. So I'm putting in, so the question is if I'm in, putting it into the honey, what part of the plant am I putting in? So I will use the leaves and the flowers. And if the stems are really pliable, like they bend really easily, those are fine too. If the stem is like woody, which can happen more towards the bottom of the plant, I wouldn't use that part. Yeah, but the flowers and the leaves would be the main. Yeah. So here's the bud. Here it is in bud, right? And this is a nice, we can really see uh, look how you can see the opposite leaves right there. And, and it's a little harder to tell, but that's a square stem as well. Here's one of our native bees, loving on the oregano, the wild oregano. And then here's a bee balm honey. So that's what I was talking about. All you really need to do, I just use garden snips, and I'll take the herb and I'll just snip it up. and put it right in the honey, and then I'll put, um, I want it to be able to breathe because fresh plants have water, and we don't want the water to get trapped. Um, it needs to evaporate, and so I will, and, and this is, um, the whole recipe and everything is on the, the book if you want to download it, but yeah, pick, you're welcome to take pictures too. Um, but so uh, I, chop, I chop up the herb, I stuff it in the jar, I pour my honey. If it's really crystallized, you might want to warm it, you don't want to heat honey too hot because you lose a lot of the good properties like enzymes and things like that out of the honey. So it's better to just warm it. Um, and you can do that if it's, if it's too thick or crystallized because we want it to really soak down into the herb, into the plant without air pockets. If it has air pockets in it, those are places where bacteria can grow. So it's important to really, and a lot of times I'll put my herb in, I'll start pouring honey in, and then I'll take a knife, like a butter knife, and I'll just pull the herb away from the sides of the jar, and that way the honey can really get down in there. But the idea is you want all the, the air to get out, and so it's really only honey and herb in the jar. And then you cover it with like a, I like to use a paper towel or a cloth, like a napkin or something like that. I put a rubber band around it, and we just let it infuse for two weeks to a month, and we let that uh, water evaporate out. Make sure everything is down underneath the honey so that it doesn't grow bacteria or mold or something like that. So you let sit for about four weeks, and then what I do is I'll just take a bowl, and I'll take a strainer, like a kitchen strainer. I'll set the strainer on the bowl. I'll take my jar of herb-infused honey and just put it on top of there and let it just slowly um, empty through the, through the strainer and then you have your honey all set up. And then you can eat that honey, the, the herb that's covered with honey, you can eat that. You could actually add it to tea if you want. Um, or if you don't wanna do any of those things, you can put it out in your yard and honeybees will come by and find it. And it's like an herbal infused honey for them. It's actually really good for them. So. That's another thing, if you don't want to use it yourself, you can 
give it to the bees. All right, our next herb is self heal. This is another native to Montana. It's also native a lot of other places around the world. Um, so, like in England, a lot of self heal grows. So you can look way back, and there'll be um, old, old recipes like herbal recipes for self heal. Um, so it has a lot of a lot of other names like hook heal and heal all. Um, anyway, it is also in the mint family, and you can see here a square stem, right, opposite leaves, um, and these really cool flower heads. I love the, the flower heads in it. This herb grows, um, it's kind of weedy, which I really like, so it'll grow in my lawn, which I love. It'll grow in my garden. Um, I've seen it growing on the side of the road, you know, just on like waste areas on the side of the road, so it's pretty flexible the way it grows. Um, and it is a really nice herb for healing the skin. Um, so let's move forward to the medicinal actions here. So it's edible, you can eat it. And the, the um, so you can just eat the leaves or you can cook them as well if you want to. It's just kind of green tasting. They don't have really any special flavor, but they're really relatively benign for an herb, meaning they're not super strong or pungent or anything like that. They're anti-inflammatory, so this is really good if you have a bug bite or a bee sting. You can even just take a leaf or some flower and chew it and make a spit poultice, um, and it will help with the inflammation and irritation. Um, but you can also dry the herb and make a salve out of it or an oil, um, and that's described how to do that in the book if you want to if you want to download that. Um, so good for inflammation. That can be topical, but it can also be internal, and so. Um, like say you have a little digestive inflammation and irritation or something like that. You ate something that didn't agree with you or something. It can be really helpful for that as well. Um, and it's an antipyretic again, so that means it will help to reduce a fever. It's a lymphatic tonic, so it's really nice for like swollen lymph nodes or um, sore throat, that kind of thing and excellent for the skin. So again, like I said, uh, you can do a, a little poultice out of it. You can make a salve or an oil. Um, you can make it into a liniment. You can just take a leaf and kind of crush it up and put it on the skin if there's some kind of um, you know, rash or irritation or something like that. It's also hemostat, and that means it'll help stop bleeding. So if someone has like a cut that's bleeding or something like that, and we feel like it's bleeding, a little bit of blood is good because we, if we get uh, an injury to the skin, we want it to flush it out. We don't want like bacteria to go in, we want stuff to go out. And so blood actually, bleeding actually helps it do that. So it's actually really good to let it bleed a little bit and flush out the injury or the wound. But then once it's flushed out, you wanna stop the bleeding, right? And so there are some herbs called hemostats that will stop or reduce bleeding and um, self-heal is one of those. It's also a really good herpes remedy, and you can use it for genital herpes or herpes around the mouth. And um, for genital herpes, I would just make a tea and sit in it, literally, which is called a sits bath. And for, uh, if you have herpes around the mouth, you can just uh, make a tea and then dip a, like a washcloth in that and just apply that, right? Or even a Q-tip or something like that would work well for that. Um, and it's really great for the mouth and the eyes. So you can do, like I said, a gargle, or you could do an eye wash or something like that. And the, the recipe that I have for this is an eye wash. And the important thing about when you're gonna bathe the mucous membranes like the eyes or the nose, like a sinus infection or something, is that you want to add salt and create what's called a saline solution. So there's a recipe to do that. And the, I, I'll tell you the proportion right now, but you can also read it in the book. It's one cup of your tea to one quarter teaspoon salt. And I wouldn't use table salt because it has other stuff in it, like anti-caking agents and that kind of thing. I would use a whole salt like sea salt or one of our other whole salts we can find, right, that are much better for the body and don't have those other ingredients in them. So here's the flowers, which I, again, just think are so beautiful. And then here's the eye wash. So you're basically making a cup of tea, and this is a medicinal strength tea, so it's stronger than like just putting a tea bag in water, 
right? We want it to be medicinal, right? It's not just for pleasure, it's for healing purposes. So it's, a, it's one cup of water to a quarter ounce of dried herb. And that looks like kind of a lot. It looks like way more than a tea bag, but that's the amount you want. Um, you steep it until it's just warm. Of course, we don't want hot water in our eyes, right? Um, we add a quarter teaspoon of salt. Stir well, make sure it's totally dissolved in there or else it, it could hurt. Um, and then we rinse both eyes and you can get, so this little cup right here is an eyewash cup and it's about like this big, right? And you can uh, put your uh, little liquid in there, put your eye down, hold it up and then blink your eyes and it really rinses the eye. It's a great way to treat like pink eye or styes or eye infections, um, eye irritations like allergies and things like that. It works really well for. Um, but you always want to make it fresh. And what that means is don't make the tea and then use it the next day. Uh, teas go bad relatively quickly and they can grow bacteria. So we always want it to be really, really fresh, like same day basically is what we're looking for. Chamomile is our next herb. Um, so there's two different types of chamomile. We have uh, German chamomile, which is our general tea herb, right, that we would normally see like at a restaurant if you order chamomile, it's German chamomile. Um, but we also have Roman chamomile. And Ro so German chamomile is an annual. And it's very easy to grow and it grows great around here. It'll self-seed and it's a wonderful, um, all of these are super easy to grow. Um, and then Roman chamomile is a perennial, which means it will come back year after year. I like to grow both. I really enjoy both of them. Um, so anyway, chamomile. So interestingly, most people, like if they don't know about other herbs, a lot of people do know about chamomile. Right, so what, what have you heard about chamomile? It's helpful for sleep. What else? Don't look at the, <laughs> yeah. I just learned that it's good as an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Also a Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it, it is a gentle, it's called a relaxing nervine, which means it's kind of calming and relaxing, which is why it's so nice to take before we go to bed, right? Um, it's also really good for digestion. And so it's one of those herbs that we can use, and that's why it's often used as an after-dinner tea, right? Not only because it's nice for sleeping, but also because it's helpful, uh, it's called carminative, which means it helps you digest your food which is really nice. So a lot of our plants that are higher in volatile oils will help with digestion. And think about all the herbs we use for cooking. Those are all high in volatile oils. And most of them are carminative or they help you digest your food, which is pretty cool. Okay, so carminative. Okay, so it's still recognized as an official drug in many places around the world, which is really cool, right? So it's used all over the world. It is a wonderful anti-inflammatory and we can use that internally or we can use that topically for external inflammation. So that might be like a sunburn or that might be like a, a rash or a skin irritation or something like that. It's oftentimes put in lotions and things like that. So you can see there's whole lines of chamomile face products and things like that, right? Um, good for allergies, partially because it's anti-inflammatory, right? Uh, antiseptic, and again, the herbs that are high in volatile oils often have antiseptic or antimicrobial properties to them. Um, and it's a good carminative, and what does that mean? Helps you digest, yes, very good. So you can use it both internally or externally for that. And the essential oil is really nice as well. On externally, is that the leaves or the flowers? The flowers are the part that's used, yes. Yeah. So this right here is Roman chamomile. This is German chamomile. So this is the one that we would normally, uh, that we see more often and use more often. And then here's a recipe for a relaxing tea. 
And this is also, this tea is really good for digestion as well because these herbs are carminative too. So we have equal parts and we always, when we measure herbs in herbal medicine, we always measure by weight because think about it, like one herb can be really light and fluffy and another herb like a root could be really dense, but still the, so, so one's gonna look like not much and one's gonna look like a lot, but they weigh the same, right? So we always measure by weight instead of by volume with herbs. So equal parts by weight. Uh, we have chamomile, which we just talked about. We have catnip, which is also in the mint family. Cats love it. But for humans, it's like just relaxing and calming and also good for digestion. Spearmint is, I think of it as like a softer peppermint, right? So it's not quite as cold or as strong as peppermint, but it's a little softer, a little smoother, has a lovely taste to it. Um, lavender, which we all know is great for sleep and resting and calming down, right? And we can drink it as a tea. And then lemon balm, which is also in the mint family and is also really calming and soothing, but also uplifting. And that's a nice one to use in the evening time as well. Plantain. So there's lots of different species of plantain in the United States. We have several native species around here. But this one, Plantago major, is from Europe. It was brought over by the settlers, and um, uh, so it's not native, but it is a wonderful medicinal plant, and it's pretty weedy. So a lot of plants that, have, like dandelion, was brought over too. That's pretty weedy too, but a wonderful, they're both amazing herbs. So I love plantain. It's such a great um, medicinal plant. So um, it's cooling and soothing to the skin and also internally. So it's really good for the digestive system as well. And I think of like um, anywhere where we have like a hole that goes into the body is like our internal skin, if you will. Our mucous membranes are actually like the inside of our skin, if that makes sense. Very similar tissue um, and does very similar things. And we can often treat it in a similar way. So plantain is good topically and internally as well. It makes a really nice tea, um, but I also love it as like an oil or a salve, or you can do like a poultice, like a spit poultice like we were talking about. Plantain does that really well. It's high in allantoin, and allantoin is a constituent, it's a chemical that's in the plant that encourages cell growth. So cell proliferation, which just means for cells to grow right and and what happens is if we have an injury and we have lost we've injured our cells we're going to have death you know the cells will die all around that area where we have a cut or whatever it is and we want it to heal in order it for, for it to heal completely we have to have new cell growth to cover that over and heal the skin allantoin does that and it does it really really well so it encourages new cell growth and anytime we want that if we want to repair, uh, plantain and allantoin work really well for that. I already talked about the spit poultice for bites and stings. It's wonderful for that. So like I said, I have it growing in my grass, which I love. And I actually plant it. I know a lot of people pull it out. I, I feel like I can't have enough of it. And so I plant it in my grass. And I, I love that it's there. Um, and I, like I said, I was a beekeeper. Right, And so if my little boys, when they were little, were running around without their shoes or whatever and got a bee sting, we would just grab a leaf of plantain, I would chew it up, and I'd put it right on the sting for them. And it will draw out the venom, and it will also reduce inflammation and help healing to occur. So um, you can use it for a lot more than, than bites and stings, but it's wonderful for the skin. It also contains high levels of mucilage, Mucilage is very soothing, so it helps to soothe the skin or, again, mucous membranes. So it can be really soothing to, like, the urinary tract or the digestive system, the respiratory system. Those are all mucous membranes. Um, and then it's also astringent, and this is a really interesting. So um, as an herbalist, this, I find it rather fascinating that this plant in particular has both mucilage, which is, like, slimy and soothing, and it's an astringent, it pulls tissue together. 
that normally does not happen together in plants. So, so plantain is actually really special and unique in that way that it can soothe and astringe. At the, usually you would use two different herbs to get that combination. And this one does it all by itself, which is quite extraordinary, honestly. Um, okay, so, the, so here it is. Here it is growing and you can see the seeds. And we have um, some species of plantain, Plantago ovada, is psyllium seed. And so the seeds can be used as a laxative, right, as a bulking laxative. Um, and that's in our pharmacopoeia still in the United States. And I always like to tell doctors, do you know that's an herb? <laughs> Um, okay, so here's this, here it is in seed, and here we go, the leaf and the seed. If you pull this leaf apart, it has these little veins that run through it. So you can pull it apart a little bit, and then it will hang separated by the veins. That's, other plants do that too, but, but um, it's kind of unusual. And then we have a recipe for um, plantain spring rolls. So you basically cook up the leaves, right? And then you make spring rolls. And it's a pretty yummy recipe. So um, you might give that one a try. Next we have calendula, calendula officinalis. Um, it is in the sunflower family or the asteraceae family. So it is edible. And I love to just take the pe flower petals Look how beautiful they are. I pull them off the calyx, which is the green part, so I'm just using the petals, and I'll sprinkle them in like salads or stir fries or soups, or, and they're just gorgeous. They don't have a lot of flavor to them, but they sure are beautiful, and they're also really healing. So it's nice to eat them. It's really good for the digestive system uh, to eat them. So good for stomach disorders, and you can also use them for ulcers. So if you have a stomach ulcer or a duodenal ulcer, I would use plantain with that too, and use those together. They're very healing and very soothing, and encourage, again, new cell growth to happen. Um, it increases circulation, so it will, um, if we're drinking like a hot tea or something like that, it will increase circulation in the body or blood flow. It's an amenagogue, which means it will encourage menstruation. So if someone, and it's not an abortifacient, it's just like a gentle starter. So um, you shouldn't use it if you're pregnant, but uh, if you're just having like spotty menstruation right at first, it can help get things moving a little better, and that, that can be helpful. Um, it also encourages sweating, and I, I'll tell you that word again is diaphoretic, makes you sweat very healing to the skin. So I put it in almost all my like salve recipes and things like that. It is so great for the skin. I mean, I just, I really love it. It's probably my number one skin herb that I use. I love this plant. Um, and it's a nice lymphatic tonic. So you can drink it as a tea or use it as a tincture and it just helps stimulate the lymph nodes. And so if we get sick or if we have a sore throat or if we have swollen lymph nodes, that can be really helpful for that. It's super safe. Most of these herbs are really safe, but you can use, like when my, when my boys were babies, uh, I would make calendula oil and I would massage their sweet little chubby bodies and you know just rub it all over and then their hair and their head. And um, it's just really, really safe and really nice for that. Here's the flower, isn't it beautiful? Here's the seeds. The seeds are really cool and very interesting. I love the seeds. And here's the leaf and the flower bud. And then here is a uh, calendula oil. And again, this is in the book. We also have a YouTube channel and we have a video on how to make salves and oils and all kinds of stuff. So you can get on our YouTube channel if you want to and watch some videos of this kind of stuff. Um, but do you see how orange that oil is? You really want a good herbal infusion will really take on the color of the plant. So you want a really good high quality um, plant. And I use, I like extra virgin olive oil, like a cold pressed oil. Is, it's really important to have a good high quality oil as well. And then you can make a really wonderful herbal oil. So, and the vitamin E in this is um, 
a preservative. It helps the oil from going rancid. So I would definitely use that or the benzoin as well. Yeah. So is it the flower petals and kind of the broader flower head? Yeah, yeah. So, yep. So it's exactly what we have there. So it's, it's called the flower head, but it has the petals and the calyx is at the bottom, the green part. Yeah. All right. So next is comfrey. And you can see kind of back behind in the corner over there uh, is a native bee having a little comfrey snack. So it's in the borage family. Symphytum officinale is the botanical name. So comfrey is also high in allantoin. And what does allantoin do? Cell, cell growth. Yeah, right? So it helps with healing, cell proliferation or cell growth. Um, so it's really good, again, for cuts and scrapes. Anytime you want to heal the skin, right? Or we could also think about internally, same. But the, the thing about comfrey is it contains pyrolyzidine alkaloids. And those can actually be really damaging to the liver. So a lot of our old herb books will recommend like taking comfrey internally, making a smoothie out of it, making it into a tea, those kinds of things. Um, today, most herbalists, including myself, don't recommend using comfrey internally because of the pyrolyzing alkaloids, it can damage the liver. And so what I prefer to do is I just use it topically. So I love it in like salves and oils. You can make a poultice out of it. You can put it on the skin, um, but I wouldn't drink it or take it internally. Uh, so excellent for the skin, bruises, sores, cuts, burns, skin ulcers, eczema, psoriasis, varicose veins, scars so good for the skin. So, and I, I use um, the comfrey and calendula a lot together for like, you know, um, salves and things like that. And plantain too is really nice in there. Look at those gorgeous flowers. Aren't those beautiful? And here's the leaves, which I also think are very beautiful. This plant is, uh, um, once you start growing it, you have to be very careful where you plant it because the root, like even if you have this much, like an inch of the root, it will grow. So once you plant it, it and it has a deep, deep tap root, it'll go down like six feet, you're not gonna be able to move it. <laughs> so make sure you plant it not too close to a house or something like that, but also know that, uh, pick your spot well. <laughs> All right, and it's super durable. So you can actually, um, I, I'll take a pitchfork and dig around it and pop it out of the ground and take my snips, my garden snips, and cut off some of the root to use and then pop it back in the ground, water it well, and it's like it never happened. I mean, it doesn't even notice. I feel like it's so like resilient, right? Okay, all right, so here is a sore muscle liniment. Um, and this is a wonderful, so I use this a lot when I broke my a rib. Um, but this liniment, so you can use it for broken bones, but you can also just use it for injuries, sprains, strains, um, post-surgery, after the scar has healed together, right? So there's, um, I actually always have this liniment in my medicine cabinet. I am sore a lot, I guess. <laughs> but um, I use it regularly. I mean, I, I really, I had hip surgery three months ago and I use it every day on my hip and it's been working great. So, um, so we have the comfrey, we have arnica, which is native and local, and we have St. John's wort, which is not native and considered a noxious weed in Montana, but it's a wonderful medicinal plant. And then we have cayenne, which is a rubefacient. It's like a counter irritant. It brings blood to an area. And we've seen like um, capsaicin will be a constituent of, of cayenne that is often put into our topical pain relief uh, blends, right, that you can find on the market. This is just the whole herb, which I like better than just the capsaicin. But, and then we have essential oils. So this EO means essential oil. And these essential oils are anti-inflammatory and pain relieving and also um, rubefacient. So they 
uh, it's like a counter irritant. It draws blood. It's a little hot and irritating, and therefore it draws blood to the area. So really great for pain and inflammation. And blood also brings nutrients and takes away wastes. And so it's so helpful for um, healing, right, to have good blood flow to an area. Our next is yarrow. This is a native plant, native to Montana. Achillea millifolium is the botanical. And we're looking for the white native yarrow, not like the very beautiful different colored yarrows. So here, and here's the beautiful leaves. And you can see why it's called millifolium. Look how like it almost looks like a little millipede, right? So yarrow is often called nature's band-aid. And that's because it does such a good job. It's antimicrobial and it's a wonderful hemostat. So it will reduce bleeding or stop bleeding and help prevent infection. So if we have a cut or something like that, um, it's one of those things that it's nice to use, like if you're on a hike or something and you get an injury, um, yarrow is really good for that. It works so well that um, it can seal like debris into a wound. And so you really want to be careful before using yarrow. Make sure you've let it bleed a little bit and then rinse it. So if you have like a water bottle or if you're at home, you can rinse it in the sink, right? And just get everything off of it before you use the yarrow because it will seal in dirt or little pebbles or whatever. Um, hemostat, what does that mean? Stops bleeding, right? It does that so well. It's also good for cold and flu. And the way that it's best used for that is a hot tea. Has anyone drank yarrow tea? It is so bitter. I mean, I take a lot of herbs. I'm, I have my palate is very wide as far as um, herbal medicines, but I don't like yarrow tea. It's so bitter. So what I like to do instead is I'll, I'll take the tincture, which is like the liquid drops of the yarrow, and I'll put them in hot water and drink it like that. Because <laughs> it's not like a pleasant cup of tea, honestly, at least in my opinion. Um, but really good for cold or flu, right? And so, and especially if you want to sweat, like if you have a fever, right? So diaphoretic makes you sweat. It's also good for the liver. It's really healing for the liver and digestive system. So yarrow is really like, it deals with a lot of different body systems, really multi-purpose and antibacterial. So like I was saying, you can use it topically or you can take it internally, but it will help prevent like an infection. It's very high in volatile oils as well. Here's the flowers really close up. And these are the types of yarrow you would not want to use. So yellow yarrow or pink yarrow or red yarrow. First, the yellow yarrow is a totally different species. It's not even related. Um, but the pink and the red yarrow are bred. And they're bred, anytime a plant is bred for its looks, there's nothing wrong with that, but it takes away from the medicinal properties, right? It's not bred as a medicine. And so mostly when I'm using medicinal plants, I'm really looking for the true native species, um, not a varietal or, or you know something that's been altered in any way, chosen for whatever it is, the flower, the color, the size of the bloom, the amount of petals, whatever. We don't, we're not interested in any of those things with herbal medicine, except for plant ID, right? So these you wouldn't want to use. And here is a first aid healing poultice. So these herbs we mix together and we grind them up. So we can see the yarrow here. We would grind that up to a powder. And then you can take that little powdered mixture add a little bit of hot water to it and you can put it and and normally if there's a cut in the skin i would put it in a cloth like mu a muslin cloth would work really well for that um, so that none of the herb none of the powdered herb gets into your cut or your you know the area um, so we just want it to sit on top right so uh, wrap it in a little muslin cloth put it on the skin and it, it the warmth will bring blood open up the pores and the herbs will get in there better. So um, you can also use a little lavender essential oil if you want in that. Next is marshmallow. 
Althea officinalis. This is not native, but it's very easy to grow here. It's a perennial. And look at those beautiful flowers. They're kind of small, but I, I think marshmallow is a really pretty, really pretty plant. So it's really mucilaginous, very high in mucilage, which, be, which means it's very soothing. So it's soothing to the skin, soothing to the digestive system, respiratory system, urinary tract, reproductive system, like it's all around soothing to all of our mucous membranes and our skin. Um, it is very easily digestible mucilage too, which means it's good for our microbiome, right? So it's like food for the good bacteria in our digestive systems. Um, excellent for long-term, that should be an M, uh, digestive issues, right? So if we're, um, if I'm seeing, so I see a lot of clients as well, I work with individuals with their health concerns, if I'm seeing someone who has food allergies or Crohn's or irritable bowel or celiac or any kind of digestive, long-term digestive issue, I will almost always recommend that they use marshmallow. And I'll tell them to take the powder and just mix it in a little bit of honey or a little bit of applesauce or you can put it in a capsule if you want. Um, but if we're treating the upper, like the throat and the esophagus and the stomach, the powder is better not in a capsule because we want it to actually coat the, that area. If we're treating the, the lower, like the intestines, you can put it in a capsule if you want. That's just fine. Um, but I'll say like um, a teaspoon twice a day, right? Every day. Let's heal and soothe the digestive system. It also is really very gently uh, stimulates the immune system. So I almost think of it as more like an immune tonic than an immune stimulant. It's pretty gentle and soft. Yeah? How does that work with autoimmune disorders? Would that be That's a great question. It won't, it would not be contraindicating. Echinacea, on the other hand, I, you know, that's one that we uh, have a little concern with with autoimmune disorders. Marshmallow is so soft and soothing. I, I think it would be actually really good. Yeah, great question. Um, and then it's also a galactagogue, which means it encourages milk production, breast milk production, right? So if we want to, um, if we're not producing enough milk to feed the baby, we can add some marshmallow in there. And there's other herbs too that are helpful for that. Galactagogue is what that's is called. Is it a fast grower and would you plant it, would you plant it by itself? Does it spread? Um, it won't spread much. Um, and. The first year, it will grow a single stalk and maybe get about this high. And then after several years, it will get quite large and tall. Mine um, is taller than the descriptions. You know, the descriptions might say five or six feet. Mine's more like eight or nine feet. Um, so it will get big and it will sell seed, but I don't ever find it to be weedy, you know? Um, and I love it. It's a wonderful plant. This is the leaf, and you can, doesn't that look soft? I mean, you can tell, like you would touch it, and it's just so soft. It's kind of like felt. Um, and that is kind of what it does in the body. Like the way it feels is kind of what it does. So that helps people remember, like, oh, that really soft feel to the leaf. You can dry the leaves and make salve out of them, and it makes an amazing oil or salve, really great. Here's the flower, isn't that beautiful? So you don't really notice, I mean like with marshmallow, I feel like I never really notice how gorgeous the flowers are unless you gotta get really close up and look and then they're so beautiful. And so this recipe is herbal honey cough drops. Um, so this is something you could do and, and these I store in the fridge in a glass jar and what happens over time is they kind of melt into each other and then I chip them away with a knife. So, um, and that's because it's honey. You can make cough drops with sugar too, but sugar depletes the immune system and actually um, doesn't have any healing qualities to it, whereas honey coats and soothes and is antimicrobial in nature. So I prefer to use honey for these, but it is a little trickier to work with. And they'll kind of, like I said, melt together after a while. So, but you can coat them with marshmallow powder, which is why these look kind of whitish, and that helps them to not like stick together as much. And it's also great for the throat. 
Echinacea. So native in Montana, we have Echinacea angustifolia that grows in eastern Montana on the plains. Um, this is Echinacea purpurea, which is easier to grow in the garden, and it makes a larger plant um, with more flowers and bigger roots. And so um, I, like, I, I like to grow Echinacea angustifolia too, but it is more challenging. It, needs, it wants a lot of lime. So just to know that, like limestone, right? So, um, but anyway, Echinacea purpurea is easier to grow. It's in the Asteraceae family, which is the sunflower family. Um, and a lot of people are fami familiar with Echinacea as well. So um, it's antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, anesthetic, and antimicrobial. So antiseptic, it's gonna fight infection basically, right? Um, anti-inflammatory reduces inflammation. It does that complicated, but through that reducing the histamine response in the body, right? Which is like an allergic response, inflammatory response. Anesthetic, so has anyone ever taken echinacea? It has like, what does it taste like? Like what is it? It kind of numbs and it's like buzzy almost, right? Like it has this like tingly, buzzy kind of feeling to it and numbing. So um, the anesthetic is that numbing feeling that you get from it. And then antimicrobial as well. So this will really help fight infection. Um, so stimulates the immune system for sure. Good for colds and flu, really any kind of illness it will be helpful for because it, it stimulates our bodies um, to produce more white blood cells so that the body can fight the infection directly. Um, so flus, colds, fevers, sore throat, infections, bites and stings. And par partially the bites and stings is because of that uh, histamine, because it reduces the histamine response in the body. And it's such a pretty one to grow. So, so nice to grow it in the garden. So here's the, the flower head close up, which is just beautiful again. Look at the pollen. And here it is. This is purpurea, Echinacea purpurea. And then here's a healing garden salve. So this, these are all herbs that we talked about in class, right? And what I did basically is I went out in my garden and I was like, I wanna make a salve from my garden. What can I use out here? And these are the ones that I chose that were just you know, growing in my garden and yard. Um, and again, there's a recipe for this, but there's also a video uh, if you wanna watch it on our YouTube channel that talks about how to make an herbal salve. What's the yeah. Essential oil, yeah. Next we have peppermint, mentha piperita. It's in the Lamiaceae or the mint family. So again, peppermint has this, a lot of these plants do, but this long historic use, right? So we've been using these plants. Humans have been using, herbs are our original medicine. In other words, before we had pharmaceuticals and all that stuff, Everyone was using herbs. And I guarantee all of you have ancestors that were herbalists back in your past somewhere. Um, but so peppermint was, has been this long historical use of peppermint, right? Over just ancient um, traditions. It's, a great, it's great for the digestive system. And normally we think about that, like a cup of peppermint tea is nice for digestion, right? Again, it's high in volatile oils, which help us encourage us to digest our food. Um, it's antispasmodic, and what that means is it will help with muscle, muscle, muscle spasms. But um, we, I think about it mostly in the digestive system. So like irritable bowel um, syndrome, for instance, where we have cramping in the digestive system, peppermint will help reduce that. So it can be really helpful for that. And it's carminative, it helps us digest our food, right? Um, it's antimicrobial, and again, those high volatile oils usually mean there's antimicrobial aspects to the plant. It is a wonderful anesthetic for pain, and it's actually, um, yeah, okay, I do have it here. So um, you can use like the essential oil, dilute it with some olive oil, put it in a roller ball, and like it's great for headaches and things like that. You like to use it with lavender, and it's also great for cough. Antitussive means it will help reduce a cough. So um, wonderful for that. 
and it is uh, the only cooling rubefacient I can think of. So remember I was saying how we have counter irritants. Those are usually hot and stimulating. Peppermint is actually a counter irritant or rubefacient that is cooling. And so it's wonderful if you have inflammation and you don't want to add more heat to it, but you still want to bring blood to the area. Peppermint. There's the leaves and the, the flower before that. And here is a peppermint throat spray. Um, this is really yummy. And you can, you can just put it in a spray bottle and then just spray it right in the mouth. Um, it's good for the breath, but it's also really good for the mouth and, it, and it's good for like throat infections and things like that. These essential oils are both edible and safe and you want to put them, you, but you want to do very small amounts. So the amount of essential oil in here is very tiny, right? We don't ever use a lot of essential oils internally. That can be really dangerous. All right. So, oh, and these aren't, um, sorry, these dates aren't right. But um, so we have our, a couple other things that we do. These are only local programs here. But we have our Herbal Immersion, which is a week-long program where we go out on private land and do some very ethical wildcrafting, and we do a bunch of medicine making and things like that. Um, and that's in July, the middle of July. These dates aren't, aren't right. Sorry about that. But it's on our website if you're interested. And then we have a day-long foraging class where we talk about foraging um, medicinal and um, edible plants, including lots of fun weeds. So um, yeah. So I just want to um, thank you all for coming, and I appreciate you coming to the class. Does anyone have questions? So out of the 10 plants, are they all OK to be in a yard with a cat or a dog? Yes. Okay. I have cats and dogs. And honestly, sometimes they'll eat them um, and like treat themselves medicinally. It's very cool <laughs> to watch them uh, do that. Animals will totally choose like different things depending on what they need so I actually like having those in my garden for them to self-medicate if you will yeah so, um, some of the ingredients that you listed uh, where do you find um, you know I would go to Meadowsweet Herbs here in town I don't own Meadowsweet anymore but um, they have a lot of ingredients for that yeah butterfly herbs might as well good food store might natural grocers but Meadowsweet, I'm pretty sure, yeah, has most of those things. Other questions? So I was picking seeds when you started. Did you um, bring in sea nettle? No, I didn't talk about that one. But that one is easy to grow here and is native. Yeah. 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 So how do you, I mean, you have, so here's all these really So Oh, I got a cut. What do I do? I mean, you know, you have to be sure that it bleeds a while because some of them you should be put on open cuts. Um. None of them have problems going on open cuts, but the issue is we just want to make sure it's clean. You know, so yeah, so I just like to let it bleed a little bit to push out instead of let in bacteria or debris or, you know, dirt or whatever. Yeah, but then you can put a salve, you could do a poultice, you could do a spit poultice, um, depending on what's happening. Yeah. Other questions? Kitties are pretty deer resistant, not to deny the deer that Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, my yard, I have a high fence, so I know lavender is deer resistant. The more fragrant one seems, less interesting. Yeah. I don't, does anyone know some more deer? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know totally. But I bet if you went to like one of the nurseries around here, or you could look it up, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna I'm just like have a thought about echinacea, but I can't, I don't know, yeah, sorry. Good question though. Anybody else? Thanks so much, you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, good, I'm glad.